Well, I've been uh, driving for a number of years now, and this is before the sermon, actually, so relax. I've had a couple accidents. I've had a couple tickets, but I still consider myself a good driver. I mean, at least above average. I'm an above average driver, and at least I think so. Uh, and here's here's the uh, the key to being an above average driver. And you have to pay attention more to where you're going than where you've been. Revo- revolutionary, right? Meaning, look, look through your windshield more than look at your rearview mirror. Now, now, there's an importance of knowing, on what, knowing what's going on behind you, and mainly as it catches up, but with you, right? Be- because what's more important than what's going on back there of, is, is what's going to be happening ahead of you. I go, same is true in life. Uh, Remember your past, but don't live there. I say, you know, get your photo albums out maybe every once in a while, but don't stare at it too long. Because more important than where you've been is where you're going. I go, same is true in church. Remember the past, but don't stay there. Uh, Certainly don't worship the past, and don't try to resurrect it, because you can't. The past is gone. It won't catch up. Um, Someone has said that sanity requires a future that's worth embracing. They're right. Another word for that is hope. That hope is required for sanity. The moment you believe that your best days are behind you is the moment you've begun to die or your soul has begun to die. Um, There was a movie and one of the great lines was, well, you either get busy living or you get busy dying. And that's a choice that that we have to make as individuals and sometimes even as, as organizations. Your best days, I'm telling you, my best days and our best days, they're not back there. They're ahead of us. They're they're waiting for us. They're right around the corner. In fact, I think I can almost see it. Ron? Is anybody nervous? (laughs) <laughs> I got thinking about what he was saying. That driving thing actually made a good point. But, hey, I'm just up here because we're talking about a board update. That's what we're talking about. And I want to do this, try to do it every month. And a lot of the reason we're doing that is so everybody knows where we're going, what we're doing, and that we can share our heart with you. And even though it's us communicating to you, it really is we want this to be a dialogue so if there's ever anything you hear that creates a question or a comment in your mind, please share that with us so that we can continue to hear what's going on, your thoughts, your feelings, because we do take that stuff very seriously. So he's talking a little bit about vision for the future, and that's what we talked about at the board meeting a lot. And specifically, it was talking about the building project. And we talked a lot about the vision and also the why of what we're doing. And uh, I need to, I think as a board, we need to talk to you a little bit about the why. Why are we even talking about a building project? And some of you have been here a long time and you know. Some of you haven't and you might not. And some of us have been here and we've been through enough that we're like, let's just revisit that again. And so I want to share a little bit of that with you this morning. So as a lot of you remember, we used to meet in the old sanctuary And um, that was a great time, but we outgrew that. And at some point, we built this family life center. And it was used as a family life center. But when we got big enough, we decided we need to make a transition to buy us some time so that we can continue to do ministry and grow and meet together. We moved from the old sanctuary to the family life center to to meet for worship. And uh, that was a hard move. Because there's a lot of history and sentiment that was attached to the old sanctuary. But we decided to do this. And and it was great. 
But it was never meant as a permanent solution. That was always just a transition to buy us some time. And um, we started to look at a building plan with the limited land and the constrictors, constrictions that we had at that time. And we put a lot of work into figuring out how we could move forward and build. But before we could break ground, we had some leadership transitions and the numbers changed. And God said, wait. And then we didn't hire a full-time pastor for a while. But shortly after we did, um, we found out that the old sanctuary, that building, had some issues. Some things that gave it a limited lifetime. And we needed to really start looking at building again. So we kind of ramped back up into a building plan and a building project. And we made some progress there as well. But once again, we went through some leadership transition. Uh, things were unstable for a little while. Once again, God said, wait. And uh, don't get me wrong, I think we did a lot of good things. We were great stewards of what we had. Well, we had the Family Life Center, and when we added this on, we, uh, we even started a satellite church in town for a while, and we had Saturday night services. We did a lot of things that did ministry during those seasons. But once again, we're at a place where I think that uh, we need to start looking at building again. We're not focused on the numbers. We're not focused on a building. But we're thinking about our identity as a church. Who is Union Church? And where does God want us to be in the future? So we're thinking it's time to begin exploring a building project again. But this time on the new property across the street. So please stay tuned as we move forward with that. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, as Ron was talking about when you guys moved uh, out here, I don't know how long ago it's been, and, and the transition that required, and for, for like years and decades, I suppose that you actually sat in, in, in pews. Did they have, probably had pews over there, I'm guessing? And, and, and that was hard. How can I worship when I'm not in a pew? Like it's required equipment uh, for worship. And it took me back to... Uh, the first church I pastored, it was in the early 90s up in Michigan City, uh, Indiana. And the way I re describe it is it was an old church with, with old people. I mean, I, I was just a young, young guy uh, at the time, and, and literally some of the people there had grandchildren older than what I was. And so to them, I'm a kid, snotty nose, and can't pay attention to him. I mean, they asked me, well, how old were the people? Well, I tell you this, they were so old that if you were 55 years old, you were still in the youth group. I mean, that's an, that's an old church. But one time, uh, we changed hymnals. See, we were still using the hymnal. And, and the guy is still up front, you know, doing this. And so we're still, but we thought, I mean, the old hymnals, they were, they were uh, getting kind of ratty. And so we just changed, we updated the hymnals. And some of the folks didn't like it because we updated the hymnals. Now, there's still hymns, but we updated. We dared to update the hymnals. And so some folks, if the hymn we were singing wasn't in the old hymnal, they would close it up. And I, I am not kidding you. They did this to me. Because back at the time, was, you know, I would sit up here, the, the guy's leading, and I'm sitting in one of those, uh, one of those king chairs. It had, you remember <laughs> those things? Like royalty. So I could see. And they're like this. They cl close up. And just like this, just this look on their face. Like, really? Um, but if we sang one that was in the old hymnal, then they open it up and they're happy. And I go, that's odd. But just those transitions. I go, it's not the change we, we care so much about or resist. It's the transitions that get us messed up sometimes. So anyway, um, but life is about change. Life is about transi transitions. It, it, it's just that way. There's nothing you can do to, to change that. There's just nothing. Okay, anyway, we're, we're back in this, this winning, and I, uh, my, my definition is, as I look at winning, it's really allowing God to do his work in you uh, so the fruit of the Spirit is produced. And so we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit and love and joy 
in peace, 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 uh, peace and patience and, and kindness and goodness and gentleness and, and faithfulness and, and self-control. And so uh, we're, we're continuing on. And this morning, I want to talk a bit about faithfulness. And, uh, but, but I, we're not, to me, we're not quite ready to think about our faithfulness, but, but the faithfulness of God. You may have noticed we, we got done singing a hymn, and it was, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's powerful, and it's true, and a lot of you remember it, and we need to remember God's faithfulness because he is right here right now today it's not just he used to be faithful he's still faithful he's faithful to you and he's faithful to me and he's faithful to his churches he's faithful to his people God is faithful and so uh, you know this morning uh, just a real quick uh, definition of, of, of faithfulness now next Sunday I'm going to talk about our faithfulness as a fruit of the Spirit, the faithfulness that we ought to have. But I thought first it's important to talk about His faithfulness to, to, to all of us. So definition of, of faithfulness, is that, that is, it talks about God's stability, God's uh, dependability, God's devotion, that we can rely upon Him. Why? Because one thing we know, and this is, this is just so huge that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and yes and forever. That, that God doesn't change. There, therefore, we can de fully depend uh, upon him. Now, understanding, though, that there's so much more to know about God. There's so much more to experience God. I believe that for all eternity, even when we leave this earth, even in the heavens, we will be finding out more about God and experiencing things about God we've never experienced before for all eternity. Uh, which I think just makes it all that exciting. But even now, don't, don't settle for what we used to know about God or what we used to experience about God. It's not that God has changed, but there's so much more about God. Some of you folks have been married now for a long, long time. Aren't you finding new things out about your spouse? Some of you, nope. I'm, finding, I'm still finding new things, new things about my wife. We've been married a long, long time. Not as long as some of you, but to me it's a long, long time. And, and yeah, she, we, we do change, but there's, still, there, there's just some new things there's new discoveries. Like, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't know that. I didn't see that. Uh, but the same thing is about God. We can, it, it's an adventure. Uh, so he will always be who he is and all the more so. The only two things that don't change, as I said, is the word of God and God. Everything else is either changing or subject to change. Embrace that. Um, now, the fact that God doesn't change either can be good news to you or bad news, depending on you think he's a good God or not so good. And we'd say, well, well, we know he's a good God. We, we know that. Yeah, we know that, but sometimes it may all, not always seem like that. Uh, in, in what ways is God always good? In what ways does it seem like he's not so good? And, and can what he allows always be good for us? You know, can that be so? I mean, uh, Bobby's uh, up here talking about the, the accident they had on this ski trip. I got this text yesterday. We're sitting in a restaurant with my family up in Fort Wayne. I'm going, you've got to be kidding. You know, so little Scotty Bates, he, he breaks his femur. End up in three places. You know, first thing that went in my mind, how loud did he scream? I know that may not seem like a good thing, but I'm thinking, that's got to hurt. What's that? Pretty loud? Yeah. <laughs> so loud it almost caused an avalanche, didn't it? Yeah. 
Here I am. I'm an old guy. I've never broken a bone in my life. Hoping I'm not going to, but I'm going, I wonder what that's like. I remember, I remember skiing a number of years ago when I was a lot younger, and I wasn't any good. We were just kind of learning, but you know, you get a little adventurous up there, and, and so you're kind of going down the hill, and I realize I am out of control, which is not a good feeling. And I'm going, number one, I could hurt myself. Number two, or even worse, I could hurt somebody else because they don't know I'm out of control. Well, maybe somebody didn't know. So I'm just kind of going down. I'm, I'm just going, oh, 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 oh this, is, this, is not, this is not good at all. Next thing I know, I fall forward. My ski, my head's down here. My skis are up here. And I went tumbling down the hill, and I go, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I got off, and I never went back. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, not, not my thing, but... So, so he has this, he, he, and, and his dad texted me uh, this morning, the surgery went well, has a long rod, a couple of steel plates in there, or, or metal plates, and they're just so glad that things are looking good, and he's out of surgery. And you might be thinking, uh, could, could there be a, a good result from this? Yeah, I'm not sure what. But sometimes things happen in our life and, and it hurts and it's confusing and there's loss and we might be thinking, why did God let this happen? Because in God's sovereignty, meaning God's in control of everything, either God causes things or he allows things. Nothing, nothing happens apart from his permission. You have to please understand that. Nothing ever happens on this earth apart from God's permission. God always knew, and God being omnipotent, all-powerful, could have done something. And we ask, I wonder why he didn't. I've been watching this thing on the History Channel, and uh, is about the concentration camp Auschwitz during the Second World War. And there were still a few survivors they were children, they were older. And they said that, that one of the big things people were thinking, because most of them are Jews, and they're thinking, where is God? Now, I have no idea how I would have responded in such horrid conditions, where they're separating children from parents, and they're telling the stories you know, off, off to the furnaces, you know, off, off to the, the gas chamber. Never saw them again. A number of years ago, I did a backpacking thing through Europe, and we got up into the Netherlands, and we used to, we'd have these guidebooks. Instead of paying the big price of the hotels, we would end up staying with families who'd run out of room for, you know, 10 bucks a night. And so one, one, uh, when we were up the Netherlands, we stayed with this lady, and she was Russian. And uh, she says the, uh, the Germans came over, and they uh, captured me, and they took me hostage, and I had to work uh, in their factories until the end of the war. And all the while, I wondered, you know, are, my, are my parents alive, or... My siblings alive. And sometimes she still travels back to her, her homeland, but she says, and, and the, the closest distance I would go through Germany, but I will not step foot in Germany. As she says it, she's tearing up. I've never stepped foot in Germany, I never will. I go around because of all the stuff, and you think, where, where is God? And some of the prisoners would say, well, well, well sure, there's a God. And others say, I, I don't think I have any faith in a God anymore, because how can a God that loves allow us, his people, to undergo such tragedy? Here, God is faithful. He doesn't change. God has always been faithful. God will always be faithful. It's the nature of God. 
one of the best known verses connecting us to God's faithfulness is this out of the book of Lamentations that says, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. The conclusion, great is thy faithfulness. Now, when you, when you think of God's loving kindness, certain things come into your mind. That God is kind based on his love. And he, he's always that way. God, God has compassion all the time. It's always there. But what we think about, when we think about God's love and his kindness, may, may not be what this actually means. Here's the thing. It doesn't it seem that God's not always kind. seems that way, doesn't it? Why? Because life isn't always easy. Had an uncle used to say, Rick, getting old isn't for sissies. Back at the time, I'm just a kid. I'm sitting there going, I guess, I don't know. Well, now that I'm old, <clears throat> I figured that he's right. It's not for sissies. It's it's not easy. Here we have a lot of our young folks sitting up here. Is being a teenager easy? Tell me. Isaac goes, no. No. If you really want to know, you could ask him why being, what, 16, 17? 18, whoa. Uh, <laughs> ooh. But... You might think, being older, that, oh, if we could just be 18 again and have hair again. Uh, but I said, no, it's, it, it's not easy. Uh, because school may not be easy, or, or the relationships in school may not be easy, or work may not be easy. And then for some, they, they live for retirement. Oh, if I could just hit retirement. Well, you may not have to go to work. That doesn't mean that life is easy. So sometimes God's loving kindness, it may not seem like it. Tragedies still come our way. And, and when tragedies strike, it seems like, oh, the, the event is over. The result seems to linger. It's, grief is slow to go. Every now and then, I, I've known Dean Beaver about all my life over here. Dean's in his 80s. Dean, Dean used to be full of fire and vinegar. <laughs> you say, nothing's changed. I remember when I was in the Little League, Dean, and our, our, our coach used to give me the bunt sign a lot. Why? Because I couldn't hit very well. So he had me bunt. And he had me bunt on two strikes. Guess what Dean does? He comes out of the stands. He's there to greet me as I'm going back to the dugout. And Dean said this, you never bunt on two strikes. <laughs> I remember that. But Dean has lost two of his sons, one to cancer, one to a car accident. He's lost his wife. not easy. And a lot of you, you know what it means to suffer, like to suffer loss. It's not just Dean. It could be relational. It seems like loss isn't common these days. And so we talk about God's loving kindness and it might seem like uh, his compassion. Uh, never fail, well then how about this and that? Uh, 
a brief quote from a oh I'm gonna get get past that. This is a, a brief quote from a book that I get a lot of mileage out of. It's by um, M. Scott Peck. It's a book called The Road Less Traveled. If you've never read it, just read the read the first chapter. Peck says this. He says, life is difficult. We're going, what? This is a great truth. One of the greatest truths. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept, then life is no longer difficult because once it's accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Please understand that. The fact that it no longer matters isn't because life changed, but your thinking changed. Whenever life is hard, I tell myself it's supposed to be hard. I don't get a pass because I'm a pastor. In fact, there are some ways in which being a pastor makes life harder. It's okay, it comes with the territory. Part of it is like this. It's mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. It's all right. And then once you've embraced the fact that life is difficult and it's okay, no big deal, then I think once again we can see God's loving kindness. The thing of it is that this loving kindness and compassion that, uh, that Lamentations speaks of is in the book Lamentations. You know what a lament is? It, it, the, the phrase of the book is, is the great lament. Definition of lament is be like an expression of loss, of grief, of trauma, of sorrow to mourn as if someone died. Really, it's, it's the book of the funeral. Lamentations is made up of five dirges or five funeral laments. I, I just gotta go, go back. This is where that, that is found. What are they lamenting? What did they lose? See, the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by the Babylonians. It's about 586 B.C. When, ba when Jerusalem fell. And they had surrounded the city for about, they figure, from a year and a half to two and a half years. So when your city is surrounded, you can't go in, you can't go out. They couldn't do like helicopter, you know, rescue things, dropping packages in. And it, and it says that things had gotten so bad. I think I have this one. That starving mothers ate their children. <laughs> That's gross, I know. It had gotten that bad. Because hunger and starvation does things to a person. It, it messes with your brain. I mean, you have to be out of your mind to be so desperate you turn into cannibalism and, and that of your own kids. But that's what it says. And idolatry was so bad, we're turning to any God that will help us. Okay. The God, the God we've been praying to, he's not doing anything, so we'll, let's go to this God. Maybe this God will help. Maybe this God, maybe this God will help. So there's odd idolatry all over the place, and then there's paranoia. They, they had gone mad to where they're even going to kill the, the author, the prophet Jeremiah, because he delivered the truth that, that Babylon is, is overtaking you, and part of it because of your unfaithfulness of your disobedience. You say, wait a minute. How can you speak about, how can you speak about 
loving kindness that never ceases, and compassion when we are starving, when people are dying, we are surrounded. And, and Babylon did overtake the city. They were taken captive. And how, do you remember how many years they're in Babylon? Do you remember how many years they were captive? Seventy. Seventy years. Meaning most of them died in captivity. And you're, and you're going to talk about his loving kindness and his compassion? You know, how do you mix that? In the loving kindness and the compassion of which it speaks basically, yeah, you're my people. You're not very obedient. You're not very faithful. And these things are going to happen as a form of judgment or punishment or discipline. And, and, and I should have wiped you out, but you're still my people. God says, I will stay with my promises to you that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Here's the loving kindness and, 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 and the compassion is, I am not going to wipe your book, your name out of the Lamb's book of life. All this is going on, but you still have your salvation. That's God's loving kindness. That's God's faithfulness. See, God is faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. You ever had an ungodly thought? A faithless thought? Have you ever, have you ever committed an ungodly act? You know, well, sure. God's people still sin. We do. Here's the great thing. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Hmm. You know, aren't we glad for that? Even, even when we stray, because there's that tendency to stray. Even when we try to find our joy and happiness in places outside the kingdom of God. He remains faithful. Sometimes that we become so pragmatic, we push God out of the framework. Like, that can't be so. That can't be true. That won't work, so it must not be of God. God gave you a brain, didn't he? Well, use it then. So God couldn't want that for you because he gave you a brain as how life works. Use your brain. Yeah, he did give us a brain, but be careful. I just throw this thought in here. Any thought or decision based more on money than on God is an ungodly thought or decision. I, I just threw the money thing in there because it's something we're faced, everyone's faced with every single day. But it could be all kinds of things. How often we don't have thoughts of faith where, where we chase after things. People are, sometimes they're chasing after money or, or maybe they're, ch they're just chasing comfort. Maybe they're chasing fun. Maybe they're chasing entertainment. Maybe they're chasing popularity. People are just chasing stuff. And God should have said at some point with each of us, that's it, I've had it. I'm done. I mean, he, he, he could have, he should have taken the eraser and taken our lives out of the Lamb's Book of Life, but he didn't. And we're still his. We're still in his family. We're still in his kingdom. We're still his children. He's still our father. That's his loving kindness. And that's his compassion. Although we would have probably given up, God is very, very patient as well. God's love for us is not based on us, 
but on him. For he cannot and he will not deny himself. Great is thy faithfulness. I invite you to pray with me now. Lord, sometimes when we read Scripture and we see a word like loving kindness, we, we take it through our own grid of what love is and what kindness is. But God, through your word, you, you redefine or you define love. And sometimes we get it right, but oftentimes we're, we're way off in right field or left field or not even in the ballpark. And here your, your love is that when I should have wiped you out, I didn't wipe you out. That's my love. Yeah, you're being taken captive. Yeah, you're starving. Yeah, people you're, are, are still dying, but my love is still there because you're still my people. Because of my compassion, you still belong to me and I'm still your heavenly father. So even when, when life gets tough and it doesn't make sense, still his loving kindness is there and it's all its fullness. His compassions are there and they're new all, all the time, every single morning, you know, every evening, whenever we need it. Even when it doesn't look like it or doesn't feel like it. The fact that we're still his and we still have heaven as our eternal home only means that God is faithful. And for that, we thank him right here, right now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.